Hello everyone. Um, welcome to the last week of official classes. Next week is finals week, of course, and, and we are going to um, have a, a day of official classes on Monday um, where I'll be doing the same thing, recording a lecture video, and, and we'll get a little bit more content out. Um, I, I wanted to let you know a little bit about the schedule for finals week. So this week we've got class every day, just like normal. But for finals week, next week, Monday will be a class. Tuesday is officially on the schedule called Student Success Day. And if we weren't in this like COVID-19 coronavirus situation, um, the expectation would be that instructors would be like on campus and available to students, um, even though there are no official classes being held, to kind of give more opportunity for students to get all their ducks in a row, to finish off the quarter, study for exams, things like that. Um, and I am planning on being available on Tuesday morning, just like um, I normally would. Like I'll I'll actually be on the I'll have a video chat link up, and I'll be here starting at 9:30 and going into the afternoon, just hanging out and seeing if anyone shows up to talk about things. Um, I'm definitely expecting that my um, critical reasoning students will be like taking advantage of this space because they have exams and things for for me um, this quarter. That class runs on exams, but everyone is invited to show up um, and try to get some time with me. Um, I'll, I'll be available, and um, so that space is just kind of like a open bucket of candy, and you can come by and grab time as, as it's available. Um, and it, there might be some reason for doing that uh, in our class. Um, you might want to talk with me about your paper projects and how it's going. Um, I did want to update you with letting you know that um, I, uh, with the exception of two students, I was able to get all of the uh, feedback videos recorded and published and posted uh, for you with the paper outline. So, and I'll get the other two knocked out today. Um, so that's uh, that's all kind of on pretty close on schedule of what I wanted. Um, so you've got like basically two weeks left to, to get your final drafts together. Um, but those lecture videos, or, or the, um, sorry, the feedback videos that I recorded for everyone, um, those are, uh, they oftentimes went pretty long and they're really full of tons of critical commentary. And I, I wanted to just kind of make a general note about that. Um, so in, I, I've mentioned before in philosophy, we, we don't just go around patting each other on the back about everything that we agree on, but we spend most of our time and energy and resources focusing on where disagreement is. So I thought it'd be way more helpful to give lots of critical feedback rather than just like a bunch of like, this, this is true and this makes sense, you know, but where, where's the criticism going to come from? Because that's going to be what's going to propel your paper to improve its quality. If you're worried about um, anything like um, oh, people can't hear me. Can you hear? I got the, I, I had some internet troubles on Friday, but I got that worked out. Um, so I think the connection is good. Everyone, everyone doing okay hearing me? Yeah. Okay. 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 Cool. Thank you. Um, so, uh, yeah, um, the thing that's going to really help uh, you in taking your paper to the next level of quality for the final draft is really going to be focused more on the critical stuff. That's, that's going to be uh, what will maybe trigger or inspire or instigate you to make some changes to your discussion, maybe add some things or modify some things. A lot, a lot of times, like adding things, other, other wrinkles into the debate to make your treatment of your issue more robust. Um, or to like be aware of where the objections are coming from. So that's been the spirit in which I've offered it. But if you do have questions about, say, something that I didn't um, remark on as being like this is really good or something, you know, I had that happening every once in a while. That I didn't complete. That wasn't a complete absence, but but definitely focus more on the critical stuff. Um, but if you're wondering whether like this thing is, you think this is good, and I didn't say it was good, and should you keep it or something like that, just in general, if you want to talk more about your paper. Uh, if there's anything about my feedback that you're not sure about or uh, it was unclear or or that you're like, um, I don't know how to fix this or like, what should I be doing instead? Please find a way to get in contact with me. And there will be some opportunity like Tuesday next week, um, but also in all the time in between. You definitely want to be working on your final draft this week. 
Um, uh, having a draft composed by the end of this week is probably a good idea to leave you some space next week for editing it and putting some revisions in and polishing it and all that good stuff. Um, and I want to be a part of that process with you as, as much as you'll you'll let me, uh, that phrase I keep saying. Um, so don't be shy about reaching out to, to have more discussion about it. Um, I, I hope uh, it is clear, maybe it's worth me reiterating again, the way that you can get access to those videos that I recorded for you is going to the Canvas assignment where you posted the outline. So once you see that there's a grade there, uh, if you go to the assignment, you'll see a little comment post with a link, and that's where you'll get, get access to, um, to the video. Uh, if you're having any trouble with that, let me know, and I'll, I can help you navigate to that spot and get a hold of that video but the the videos are not public published publicly on YouTube you need to have the special link to be able to get access so you're the only one I've sent that link to so you're the only one who can watch the video if you give it out to other people then they'll have access to it but the power is yours you have control over basically who gets to see that video um, but I, I it's private for you that's the main intention um, so that's Monday and Tuesday of, of finals week Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday are uh, are the official finals period, and I will be using our finals period for a bonus seminar. It'll be a two-hour seminar um, that covers, uh, or that that's going to be scheduled for when our final exam uh, was scheduled to take place in person. Um, I'll be online for that time, and I post. I think I put the. You can you can definitely look up the final exam schedule on the Bellevue College website. I think I also posted it into the syllabus, so you can reference that for that information. Um, I don't remember off the top of our of my head right now what our time was uh, scheduled for, but I will be hosting a and and it will it'll it'll count as attendance mandatory attendance, or I'm sorry no it'll be extra credit yes. I make this session extra credit, sorry. <laughs> um, it'll be a bonus seminar with a bonus reading. If you show up, you'll get extra credit attendance uh, for counting as two days since it's a double hour period. I thought that'd be fair. Um, and if you do reading comments for it or do a journal on that reading, I'll give you extra credit reading comments and extra credit journal credit as well. So there's a lot of extra credit opportunity with our finals uh, period, this like bonus thing. So uh, that'll be available next week, too. But uh, in and between all that, you know, reach out to me. We can talk whenever. Um, and uh, I, I do want to uh, assist you with this paper project. It's a big, ambitious project. I've been very pleased with, uh, in general, with what people have, uh, the work they put into it already. Um, I've had generally better scores than average uh, for the outline, so that's really cool. Uh, but I did want to emphasize something very especially about the final draft assignment and it's evidenced in the instructions I sent out for the for the final paper um, that I think were in the weekend update email but the the major thing I want to emphasize here is that when I'm grading the final drafts it's not just a matter of putting together a prose version of the ideas that you had in your outline I'm also looking for how you're going to improve your treatment of your controversy and improve the defense of your thesis, and uh, and how you en especially engage with your opponent. That that one is really really big. Debating with your opponent is one of the most important things for doing good philosophical work. If your paper is just sort of rationalizing your perspective to yourself, and not engaged with why people might disagree, then your defense of your position is much less adequate. Uh, in terms of actually resolving the rational controversy that your paper has targeted as the ambition for why we have the paper in the first place. So looking for an improvement to the um, the discussion you're having, how robust you're entering into the debate around your topic, is the main thing I'm looking at for deciding on a grade. Um, so it's kind of like uh, if the first the paper outline was graded mostly on basically effort like how are, are you even if if I thought maybe your arguments are fairly weak or open to objection if you're trying to do all the things I had in that checklist I can see the effort that you've put into it and just the content how, how much are you putting into the paper that's how I was sort of deciding on a grade for the outline assignment when it comes to the final draft I'm looking for how you're improving and editing your, your treatment of your issue. And all of you have room for improvement on that. So even if you got an A on the, on the outline, 
Like you got 95 on the outline, which was I think the highest score I gave out of was a 95. Um, if you got if your grade was really really good on the outline, that doesn't mean that you have nothing you need to change for the final draft. And if if your paper in the final draft really just looks like the same thing you had in the outline, then that's not going to score very well. And so all of you have room for improving your treatment of your topic and looking to do that to like participate more into the process of writing a, a good work of philosophy. That's the main thing that I'm looking for. Now, uh, one other little comment on that. In terms of improving your paper, I've given you a bunch of feedback in the feedback videos to try to assist you with this. But I am definitely not grading in this way, where I'm like, well, I, I you know, made a stink about this, that, or the other thing, and if you don't change that, then you're going to lose points or something. That's not what I'm looking for. To, that, that's not the way in which I'm going to be grading improvement. If I offered feedback, it's still your paper, and you decide what you, which of that feedback you think, like if I made some arguments or put some ideas out there, if you're like, yeah, no, I, I think that is relevant, that's a good point, that needs to get respected in my treatment, cool. If you don't think so, if you like disagree with my feedback or think that what I was encouraging you to talk about is not something that you want to steer the paper into, that could be okay. Um, this is this is your work, and I'm not grading your work based on what I would have written or what I think is true or what arguments I think make sense, but just your participation in this process and kind of thinking for yourself about it as well. So um, I've offered my feedback to try to help you with improving your paper, but responding to my uh, criticisms or suggestions is not the only thing that I'm tracking in terms of how you're improving your paper and making it more robust at doing the things that we want a philosophy paper to do, um, if that makes sense. Uh, chat, is this, is this making sense to you, everyone who's here right now? Uh, 15 people we've got present live. Um, you any, any questions about how this is going to look or how my grading is going to work? Know what the expectations are? Yeah? Cool? All right, awesome, cool. Still a little iffy about the improvement part. Okay, um, maybe this is another thing I can say that might help. So when you were, when I first assigned the, um, is it possible to send the YouTube videos via email? Absolutely, if you want uh, to make a request for that, Nathan, um, just send me an email and I will, I can forward it to you that way. Um, that's no problem. Cool. Um, so on the improvement part. So um, when I first assigned the paper outline, and we had those in-class sessions where I was like talking about how to write a philosophy paper, I sent along a document. Actually, you got a couple documents from me. One was called Writing for Philosophy, and that's where I like broke down the whole process of like how you brainstorm and how you edit your ideas and all that kind of stuff. I gave you the full, complete picture here of. Uh, you know, one 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 stab I took at describing and laying out the process of writing a philosophy paper. So so I put that out there, and I also gave you a checklist for like here are the things that a good philosophy paper needs to do: rational controversy that's being targeted. You've got a thesis. You're taking a stand on that issue about how you think it should be resolved. You're arguing for it. You're shouldering your own burden of proof to defend your thesis. You're entertaining objections from your opponents and then responding to them. Those five things are the really core functions of any philosophy paper. And I wanted you to take as ambitious a stab at doing all those things as you could for the outline. Like we were saying, we want to top load as much of that effort into the outline as possible. To have a, a complete blueprint of all the intellectual work that you'd put into writing a draft. Okay? When it comes to doing the final draft, the goalposts have not moved. They're still in the same spot. Like, because for the outline, I was like, here's where the standards are. You know, here's here's what any philosopher, professional philosopher or undergraduate intro student, there's still the same things that we have ambition for, for doing good philosophical work. And I wanted you to shoot for that as best you could. So when it comes to it, trying to improve on it, the it's not like we're looking for different things. We're looking for the same things, just done more effectively, maybe more completely. Um, maybe that means adding more arguments to shoulder your burden of proof. As you may, uh, this happened in um, a, a lot of the outlines where you're offering some arguments to defend your thesis. 
But maybe some of those arguments stand in need of defense themselves. Like you make claims and we're like, why should we accept that claim as being true? If that is itself controversial, maybe that needs a little bit more fleshing out or a little bit more developing as an argument. So you can make your shouldering of your burden of proof maybe more robust or adding more arguments into it um, that are relevant to the defense of your thesis. Um, in almost every case, I, I think the treatment of the opponent could be much more robust as well. Maybe some of my critical feedback helps get your imagination going and recognizing other places that your opponents could push you around on. Or what are some of the other possible answers other than your preferred one, your thesis position, for how to answer the rational controversy that's in place. Or maybe the responses that you're giving to those objections could be beefed up a little bit more and more developed. Um, maybe you could treat your opponent with greater charity instead of strawmanning them or dismissing them or all the same stuff that we were shooting for with the outline maybe can be done more effectively, more robustly, that you could respect the controversy that you're getting into and just dive into it more deeply. Um, that's the kind of space for improvement that we're looking at for the final draft. So is, is that ha uh, helping, Anish? Maybe it's really important. Yeah, that's helpful. Cool. Um, I think it's it's worth emphasizing that it's not like the goalposts are moving or something like that. Um, it's the same same goal that is kind of superhuman already that we were shooting for initially, and you're just going to be putting more work into getting closer to uh, accomplishing that more and more. Yeah. Any any other questions people have in the chat? And I try to make a, a big emphasis about this improvement thing as the basic way in which I'm evaluating your work and, and going to be putting a grade on it because it's not uncommon to me to see that, oh, last minute, you know, getting in there at the end of finals week, you got to turn something in, that you've already done all this work to put the paper together, that you're just going to kind of make more superficial or cosmetic changes to the paper. And that's, that's not going to cut it. When I have done uh, this class before where we don't skip the rough draft assignment where it was like outline, detailed outline, rough draft, response paper, final draft, especially when I've done that format. I've seen a lot of final drafts that are really just the same thing as the rough draft. You're in a little bit better position because you haven't written a rough draft yet. You just have it in outline format, so you do have to like compose it in prose. Um, but I, I am still looking for the updating of the ideas. It's not just the matter of doing the work of taking the ideas in the outline and turning them into prose, into written prose. Um, that That's really important. So don't fall into that trap of, of only making small changes or just taking your outline and translating it directly over into prose. Uh, I am looking for you to kind of do more reflection, do more critical consideration of what's happening here and be responsive to that as best you can. Whether that's coming from me and the critical feedback I've given, or what you can do on your, under your own power with your own intellectual imagination, um, etc. Okay, if there's nothing else, let's get back into Wittgenstein. We good? All right. Thank you for the feedback. Wonderful. All right, all good. All right, so... I think by the end of class on Friday, if I remember right, um, we had done a lot to set up the conversation of just what are we talking about when we're doing philosophy of language. And we talked about the, the sort of traditional way of thinking about linguistic meaning that we got using St. Augustine's theory as sort of the poster child for uh, this intuitive and traditional way that we think about language. And again, the, the thing that sort of is defining of Augustine or the traditional model of understanding ling linguistic meaning is that it's a matter of basically a code. Conventions of association between symbols or signs and what they signify, what they represent. So we talked about like the stop sign example or, or any of the words that we come up with, like the noises we make with our mouths and what they represent. And that communication for this traditional model is a matter of like a thought that a speaker has that they encode into words and then the the audience or the the listener in that communication relationship receives the code and decodes it and comes up with an idea in their head that's the interpretation of what the person is saying 
and successful communication is when those two ideas are more or less like similar enough to, to count. Um, they don't, it's never going to be perfect, but if they're sufficiently similar, then we'd say successful communication, and if they're wildly divergent, we'd be like unsuccessful communication. One other note that I, that I, I wanted to get in here, though, that I forgot to mention on Friday, I believe, is that philosophy of language is a little bit different than linguistics. Um, and linguistics is a, a kind of empirical pursuit. It also has some formal and theoretical things going on in it, and certainly what's happened in the philosophy of language has influenced linguistics greatly. Wittgenstein has had a huge influence on modern linguistics. Uh, as I mentioned, I do a little uh, philosophy of language stuff for my critical reasoning students that's also intended to have practical application to how to be better speakers and better listeners, how to be effective communicators. And how we think about that has been very, very influenced by Wittgenstein's contributions to, the, to this conversation on the level of the philosophy of language. But these things are n noticeably, or no, uh, there, there's a contrast between the kind of inquiry that's done in linguistics and the kind of inquiry that's done in philosophy of language. They're both targeting and trying to understand language and, and linguistic meaning, but taking it from slightly different angles. And it's very, very similar to the analogy between metaphysics and science, empirical science. I know we skipped our philosophy of science reading sad uh, the Mumford reading I if anyone is interested I hope you you were able to take a look at it or maybe you do after the quarters all over when all the work is done if you want to talk about it I'm definitely happy to do that Mumford was a really fun piece I'm sad we didn't get to do it but in that article we would have talked a lot about how uh, philosophical metaphysics study of reality what exists and how does it exist and what empirical science is up to we're trying to figure out like the causal laws of the universe they really have the same object of understanding. They're both trying to gain knowledge about reality and how reality exists, but they do so in very different ways. Um, metaphysics is hard to define here in contrast. That's what the whole Mumford article is about, is like how do we understand the relationship between these two things? But it does seem like they're somewhere along parallel tracks, right? They're both interested in the same object of knowledge, and that's similar to how philosophy of language and linguistics are both interested in understanding language as a phenomenon, right? But the way that they approach it, it can be very, very different. As we, with the, the treatment of metaphysics that we've done in this class, it's been very different from, it, or the, the way of the style of argumentation and how to defend a theory is different than the approach of, that empirical science takes about how to make observations and generalize claims on the basis of those observations. Metaphysics doesn't seem to trade on the observations themselves. It's more about how do we think about those observations than using the observations as like direct evidence for one theory or another. And one way that is available for understanding the difference between metaphysics and science, philosophical metaphysics and empirical science, is that metaphysics is interested in what is necessary. What's sort of universally the case about reality, no matter the contingencies of particular circumstances, whereas empirical science is very interested in the contingent differences and is not necessarily about what's universal. Even when we're talking about universal laws of nature, they're just universal to our contingent universe. Maybe the laws of nature, logically, they could have been different, and maybe there is some universe out there where the constant of the speed of light or the gravitational constant have different values or that the laws of nature are different. It doesn't seem like the laws of nature themselves are metaphysically or logically necessary. Otherwise, science wouldn't have required us to make so many observations to figure out which pattern is it because there's a lot of logical options here. That might ring a bell from how Hume was talking about the difference between a priori knowledge and a posteriori knowledge. Right? Knowledge of matters of fact, you need observations of the world, experience is necessary to have that knowledge, because logic itself won't tell you which one is true. Right? It, it, all the different options for what the laws of nature could be like are equally logically possible, so we need to make observations of the world to figure out the difference. I, I'm belaboring this maybe a little bit longer than I need to, but the bottom line point for the application for our current topic with Wittgenstein is this. Linguistics is more interested in the contingent ways in which language manifests. So 
we've got all these different natural languages like say English or Japanese or Spanish or Swahili or all sorts of different things right and they all have their different rules they have different rules of syntax of like how you arrange words in a sentence to create a meaningful idea like the formal rules of language and they differ in terms of their semantics the kind of noises or written symbols that encode certain ideas okay? using the kind of traditional St. Augustine sort of style of understanding language right there's a lot of contingent differences with what linguistic communities actually do um, and, and understanding those differences matters. I mean, that's knowledge too, right? That's, we, we want some people doing this linguistic study as well and understanding the contingencies and the different systems of communication that are out there. But philosophy of language is more like, what are the universals? What is language? Not necessarily the different versions of it, different examples of it, but what's the kind of, what's the way in which they all count as language as an expression of this phenomenon so what is sort of necessary or essential or universal to languages that's what philosophy of language is more interested in it's not about what systems of encoding meanings but rather what is meaning itself what's linguistic meaning itself and how how does that happen in a way that's generalized from all the particular contingent ways in which that can happen um, that's what philosophy of language is about. So Wittgenstein is offering a theory and Augustine is offering a theory that isn't um, distinguishing between different versions of language, but what language as such, language qua language, what is that? That's what we're trying to figure out. So does that distinction make sense? I'm hoping <laughs> not hearing from chat just yet yeah okay okay um, this might be a fun thought experiment for uh, maybe wondering why would it matter to do a philosophy of language is linguistics enough imagine that we are looking for extraterrestrial life with signs of intelligence in the universe if we're imagining some other beings that exist that are also sentient they have thought and intelligence um, and are able to communicate um, all bets are off kind of about what their evolutionary development might look like what their bodies are like what resources or mechanisms do they have to make language happen out of uh, would we be able to recognize if an alien species was attempting to communicate with us well we can't necessarily presuppose that they're gonna do it our way right that they're gonna their abilities of using language are gonna work in the same contingent ways that we do it if we had an understanding of what language is regardless of the different forms the contingent forms that it can take that would be pretty helpful in helping us be able to recognize that something that isn't the way we do it would still be something like that right um, maybe you've heard of the SETI program the search for extraterrestrial life that that NASA and other international um, scientific programs like participate in like there was a, a probe sent out I think it was Voyager that had uh, it was basically a uh, put in a message in a bottle and thrown it out into space to see if any intelligent life would pick up on it kind of like letting the universe know hey there are intelligent beings on planet Earth you know uh, third rock from the Sun like find us here and there is a, a lot of different attempts for how to demonstrate um, our like what's going on there's attempts at communication like there's a bronze plaque that has a picture of what we look like that it has a, a kind of a, a map of like where our planet is um, and it even has a, a record uh, with encoded information about our history and some music and all this kind of stuff but the other thing that the SETI program has done is just sends out radio signals that demonstrate basic mathematical principles and that's it just like uh, patterned um, radio signal bursts that show uh, that demonstrate understanding of math 
They're like math is the universal language of intelligence. That any other being that that exists out there that's capable of intelligent thought and intelligent communication would be able to understand math. They'd be able to recognize that this radio signal is not random bursts, but it's patterned, and it's patterned in a way that demonstrates understanding of mathematical principles. So maybe that is a way of making communication happen. What if they don't use base 10? Um, well, there are some ways to encode this stuff without having to rely on base 10, because we're not sending out numbers, um, but we're just sending out little bursts of radio signals in certain intervals with, with uh, in, in ways that could not be naturally occurring, right? That end up exhibiting mathematical relationships. Um, but anyway, bottom line point here is that uh, language can happen in a myriad number of forms, and it doesn't happen in the form that we're used to with our particular language, like not all languages work like English does, for example, but also that all the things that humans are capable of doing with language, there might be a way to understand linguistic meaning that doesn't even presuppose those contingencies. And that's especially something that Wittgenstein has on his mind. Uh, I wanna, I'm going to give you some quotes here as we go. But um, the, one of the main objectives I have for, for today uh, by the end, by the time we close up shop here, is that you have an understanding of what Wittgenstein's alternative theory of language is proposing, con in contrast to what Augustine's got going on, this sort of traditional model of language. Um, so this is in Aphorism Three, on page six. Um, Wittgenstein says Augustine, we might say, does describe a system of communication. Only not everything that we call language is this system. So again, it, it, it covers one way that language could express itself, but is not maybe the necessary or essential root of what all language, in fact, is. And one has to say this in several cases where the question arises. Will that description do or not? So will Augustine's description do or not as a way of capturing what's happening with language? The answer is, yes, it will but only for this narrowly circumscribed area, not for the whole of what you're purporting to describe. So in other words, this is sort of defining Wittgenstein's position contra Augustine. He's like, Augustine's got not a bad theory for understanding this part of language, but there's this part of language too. There's all this other stuff that exists that doesn't fit into the scope of Augustine's theory that still counts as language. So we need a theory that can capture that. So it's not so much a direct rejection that language doesn't sometimes take the form that Augustine has proposed with signs signified relationships between symbols and what they represent. He's like, sometimes that is what's happening with language, a thought encoded and decoded into a thought. Sometimes that is part of language, but it's not everything. Let me keep going with the quote. It's as if someone were to say, playing a game consists in moving objects about on a surface according to certain rules. And we reply, for Wittgenstein's side, you seem to be thinking of board games. And that, presumably, that's a fine description of a board game. But they are not all the games that are, or there are. You can rectify your explanation by expressly restricting it to those games. So, Wittgenstein's going to say, well, when it comes to this use of language, Augustine's maybe nailed it. But there's all this other stuff we need to capture too. And Wittgenstein's alternative theory is trying to capture all these other things that count as linguistic phenomenon that don't necessarily play by the rules of what Augustine is describing. When I draw this on the board in class, when I, when I give this lecture in person, instead of just having circles like this, I usually also give them some three-dimensional shape, like a bowl inside of another bowl. So it's not only that Augustine's trying to give a description that applies to this area of linguistic phenomenon, but he's saying that this is the essence of language, and that's the thing that Wittgenstein disagrees about. He's like, there's a deeper basis that, even, that doesn't just cover this other stuff that the Augustinian theory doesn't capture, but that also explains in a deeper way the stuff that Augustine's theory does capture. Okay, so there's going to be a twofold project to this. Wittgenstein's going to try to draw out how there's other things that should count as language that don't fit neatly into Augustine's pattern of sign-signified relationship, but also that an analysis of sign-signified relationship conventions shows a deeper reality that makes that possible. Okay?
This is kind of a deep idea. And if we had more time with Wittgenstein this week, we could draw that out and develop it out a lot more. This is going to be kind of like a quick little taster of Wittgenstein, and, and we're not going to be able to go as deep into this as I might want to for just the sake of time. Doing this, not doing this means we'll have time to do some, some other stuff with, with morality this week. But, um, but that's, that's the game plan that Wittgenstein has. And what is he saying is this deeper bull. Wittgenstein's theory of language is sometimes referred to as a use theory of language. Wittgenstein wants to say what gives linguistic phenomenon or linguistic behavior meaning is what we're doing with the words, not what they represent. So let me say that again. Wittgenstein wants to say it's what we do with language that gives it its meaning, not what those words represent. Not some sort of sign signified code sort of thing, but it's how language factors in to behavioral games that are bigger than just that convention. Let me give you another example here. Um, <clears throat> so he, um, he talks about this primitive language of the slab builders, right? One person yells slab and another person brings a slab over to, to with part of what they're constructing. Um, okay, so, and how do we learn those things? Well, through ostensive definition. That's how, that was Augustine's story, right? I'm like, cup, 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 or Tim, 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 right? And so you might slab, 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 right? And then someone's like, slab, like, bring me, there could be other gestures involved here, right? Um, so this ostensive teaching of words, I'm quoting from aphorism six here on page seven. This ostensive teaching of words can be said to establish an associative connection between word and thing, symbol, and what it represents. But what does this mean? Well, it may mean various things. But one very likely thinks first, if you're thinking like Augustine does, this traditional model, one very likely thinks first of all that a picture of the object comes before the child's mind when it hears the word. So we're thinking about children here who are first learning about these words, learning like cup, cup, hat, hat. Right? And then they're like, oh, when I hear the noise hat, now I think of things like this. I have a mental image about it. Okay, but now, if this does happen, is it the purpose of the word? Is it, in other words, is it the purpose of the word to elicit a mental image? And Wittgenstein replies, he's sort of talking to himself here. It's really, maybe you found it obnoxious. I totally understand if you did, of like how hard it is to follow this reading because it's like Wittgenstein talking back and forth and debating with himself. And sometimes he's in the Augustinian voice and sometimes he's in his contrary, you know, criticism voice of the Augustine model. So it can get a little confusing. But he asks, is it the purpose of the word to elicit this mental image? And he answers, yes, it may be the purpose, emphasis his, he italicized there that, right? It may be the purpose. I can imagine such a use of words, of sequences of sounds. Uttering a word would be like striking a note on the keyboard of the imagination. And he says, but in the language of the slab builders, it is not the purpose of the word to evoke images. There, in that language, when someone yells slab, the purpose of yelling slab is to bring the gosh darn slab over, right? It's supposed to elicit a behavior on the part of the listener, right? And that's the purpose of it. That's its function. That's the use of the word. And that's what gives it its meaning, according to Wittgenstein. It's what we're doing with the words, these conventions for behavior, rather than conventions of what words stand for what mental images, like coding things, okay? So, but, let, but he does say, you know, just kind of like with the board game example, this may be the purpose. Some of language might be for getting mental images to happen, but there's a lot more to it than that. There's other ways in which language has meaning and has reality other than just getting people to have certain ideas in their head. So <clears throat> I've got some examples for this. So um, what's a good example where this is the purpose? Maybe a poetry reading, right? So someone... You know, poets up there, stands up next to the podium or, you know, sitting in a circle or something, and they read this poem, and it's a bunch of words that they're throwing out there. And the whole purpose of them throwing the words out there is to provoke 
something in the audience that's sort of internal to them, right? Like the imaginative images that come out from the poem or the feelings it's supposed to elicit. When you hear those words, it's like striking notes on the keyboard of the imagination. You hear the word, boom, you get the idea. And you're really trained for this. Like, you don't even have to think about decoding the noises that are coming out of my mouth, right, or coming out of the speakers of your computer or device that you're using right now. Um, you, they just read straight for mental images. When I say hat, you're like, this thing, you know, cup, this kind of thing, you know. They're just spontaneous about how those images, like, erupt into your imagination. Um, and that could be a purpose. That could be the activity. The use of language is for that purpose. But in so many other instances, this is not the only thing. And the significance of talking or speaking is not just a matter of getting the idea in someone's head. So I, I like using this example. I really wish we were in the classroom right now because it would make a lot more sense. Um, but uh, let's say class is out. You know, I've dismissed class, but I'm hanging out next to the door of the classroom, and I'm talking with a student. And you come up and you're like, can you please get out of the way? Can you please move? So Because you want to get through the door. And I'm like, cool, gotcha. And I just stay there continuing to talk to the other student. And I don't move. And you're like, uh, Tim, uh, did you hear me? Um, can you move? And I'm like, yeah, I heard you. Gotcha. Hear you loud and clear. And I just keep talking over with this other student. And I'm like, Tim, you finally like starting to get fed up with me. You're like, Tim, I don't think you understand. I think we're having a failure to communicate here. I just asked you, can you please move? And all you've done is say, I understand. And I'm like, no, I think we have successfully communicated. When you said those words, you had this thought in your head. You, you are requesting that I move my body physically out from this location, presumably because you want to get out of the room. And that's the image that's in my head. I'm pretty confident that's the image that's in your head when you said those words. So we successfully communicated. Blah, 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 blah. And I go back to talking, right? You're going to be like, this isn't working, <laughs> right? It's like, even if we're, are the ideas we have in each other's heads are the same, it seems like we have not successfully communicated, right? Or there's a way to say that, like, this is not all it takes. This isn't sufficient for successful communication. That the communication has its purpose because of its connection with behavior. And so when I'm not responsive, like, if I was going to be relevantly responsive to this communication conversation that we're having when you're saying these words please get out of the way please move and I'm receiving that there's an expectation that I give some sort of response like no I'm not going to move or yes I will and then I move and I have to acknowledge there's some gesture in the behavioral game that I need to be taking that's a part of successful communication here the purpose that you have for speaking, which is not just about getting an idea in my head, but getting me to actually move, has to be addressed for there to be successful communication. And as long as I'm not doing that, if I merely am just decoding your words into an image in my head, that isn't sufficient. Is this example making sense to, to you in the chat, everyone? Yes, yep, cool. Awesome, thank you for the feedback. Now, it might be tempting for the Augustinian side to say, oh yeah, of course we care about behavioral stuff, but that's not language. Like, language is just the stuff about the ideas, right? And all the behavioral stuff is after that, right? That's all maybe the space of ethics and action, and, and it doesn't have to be treated as part of the phenomenon of language. And to this, Wittgenstein does have a reply. I'm, I'm kind of reframing how he presents all this, but think back to the first aphorism of the reading. After that quote from, from St. Augustine, and he's talking about it, he says, Now think of the following use of language. I send someone shopping. I give him a slip of paper marked five red apples. He takes the slip to the shopkeeper who opens the drawer marked apples. Then he looks up the word red in a chart and finds a color sample next to it. Then he says a series of elementary number words, I assume that he knows them by heart, up to the word five. And for each number word, he takes an apple of the same color as the sample out of the drawer. It is in this and similar ways that one operates with words, how one acts with them. But how does he know where and how he is to look up the word red, and what is he to do with the word five? Well... I assume that he acts as I have described, 
explanations come to an end somewhere. But what is the meaning of the word five? No such thing was in question here, only how the word five was used. Now this passage, I'm guessing, was somewhat confusing. Just like, what the hell is happening here? What Wittgenstein is trying to do is show a way to understand successful communication that doesn't rely at all on the competent speaker or listener understanding the sign signified relationships between the words five red and apples okay so in terms of like what can count as language that doesn't fit into augustinian's model here's a counterexample it might be a counterintuitive counterexample but it is a counterexample nonetheless i mean if i gave you let's say we're um roommates you know we we uh share an apartment or a house or something and I can't go to the store, but you're like, I'm going to the store, you want anything? And I'm like, yeah, here's my grocery list. And I give you a slip of paper. How are you going to successfully complete this linguistic activity? Well, the way you'll probably do it is how Augustine describes it. You'll look at those words and you're like, I know English, five red apples. Five refers to a number, red refers to a color, apple refers to what we call a natural kind concept, like a category of things that exist in the world. And you'll put together a mental image of five red apples. And when you go to the grocery store, if you're going to, you know, meet my request, you'll make sure that the contents of your basket match that mental image. You'll get five red apples in the basket, buy them, bring them home, give them to me. Be like, mission accomplished. Awesome. So there you use language in the way that Augustine's describing it. But Wittgenstein's saying, isn't there a way that we can understand that same activity being successfully performed without any knowledge of what five stands for, what red stands for, or what apple stands for, in terms of like a mental image, like decoding a mental image out of those symbols? And it's possible. Um, when I tell this story in class, uh, when I've given this lecture in the past, I like to tell a, a kind of fantastic story about some alien who crashes their UFO in the back alley of a grocery store and the grocer is like, oh, I'm going to help this dude out and give him a job. Um, so the, the alien doesn't know English, doesn't know how to communicate at all, but uh, the shopkeeper is able to train them to taking slips of paper from customers and going and tracking down their groceries for them using the kind of method that Wittgenstein describes here. So the alien needs to be able to look at the slip of paper recognize there are three terms, but they don't need to understand what those terms represent. The first term, or actually they start with the, the third term, the natural kind term, the one that says apples. They may not know what apple stands for, they may not even be able to make the noise with their mouth or recognize that those written inscriptions stand for a noise. They don't have any of that going on from the Augustinian model, but they the whole grocery store has been arranged for them to perform this activity. So there's all these cabinets everywhere with labels on them. And when the label for apples matches the slip of paper, they're like, oh, that's the same inscription. They don't need to know what it represents. They just need to know it is the same. It's just a symbol, or, or not even a symbol, just a label, right? A label that matches, okay? They open up that cabinet. And then they've got a little color swatch. You've, you've seen this at like Home Depot or something for buying paint, where it's like all these different pieces of paper with samples of colors on them, and they could be labeled too. So the second term refers to that color swatch. They take out their color swatch, they find the color sample that matches the symbols of red spelled out on the slip, and then they compare it against things that are in that cabinet. And then they start pulling things out of that cabinet and putting them in the basket in an order that is a counting order. So one, two, three, four, five. And when they get to the one that matches the five and the five red apples slip of paper, whatever it is, then they stop putting things in the basket and they're all done. But, um, and so the whole time through that process, they were able to get the same thing you did when you came up with the mental image. Um, but they get five red apples in the basket, but they don't know what five stands for. They don't know it's a number. They don't know that red is a color. They don't know that apples are a type of thing. They're just following this procedure. Um, no, I haven't given it out yet, Hudson. Uh, we can do it right now, though. I'm just kind of interrupting it. Uh, code word is uh, alarm, because I had problems with my alarm this morning. Um, alarm is the code word. Okay, so... Um, 
Uh, whoa, what's going on here? Stop that. Something just popped up in my computer. Sorry, one second. This is for everyone record. I'm recording this at home for. Hey, go away. There we go. Okay. So, Wittgenstein's trying to demonstrate a case of successful communication in which uh, the person doesn't have the knowledge of sign signified relationships that under Augustine's model, if you don't understand that, you don't understand language. In order to be linguistically competent, you got to be able to do this decoding of an idea with an inscription um, or whatever it is that's the basis of the language, the noise or an inscription, doesn't matter. Wittgenstein's saying, look, successful communication without any knowledge of sign signified relationships. Now this case example can be a little goofy. I mean, I've taught this many times before. Some students are like, but isn't the alien still thinking about five red apples somehow? Or the, And maybe not. And here's a really good demonstration of maybe why not. Think about the counting part, the, the word five. One, two, three, four, five, right? There's no need for those words to actually refer to any particular numbers. Like it could be banana, umbrella, beavis, butthead, five. And then and that's when they stop, right? So they don't have to think about it in terms of this is a number. It's just a procedure. They're just, they might not even be counting them in their own recognition of what's happening. Um, banana, umbrella, beavis, butthead, five. Oh, I'm supposed to stop now. That's it. You can see how maybe Wittgenstein would be very interesting to uh, modern programmers, AI type people. Um, because computers, when they perform functions, they're able to act, um, but they don't necessarily have minds, right? They're not, they don't have mental images, um, but they're still able to perform behavioral uh, actions, right? They, they can have a protocol for acting. Um, the computer doesn't necessarily know what numbers mean, but it has a functional system of what to do with those numbers once you give it to them, okay? So the AI can can do things intelligently, even if it doesn't have a mind, even if it's not consciously entertaining a mental image, it can do the same kind of work of behavior that language does. On Friday, I mentioned uh, for framing up Wittgenstein that he's trying to get language out of the head and out into the world. And for Wittgenstein, everything that's meaningful and significant about language is purely about what we're doing with it, how it is a part of what he calls language games, which are really rules for behavior. Um, so linguistic meaning is defined by the role it plays in a, in a game, in a set, a set of coordinated behavior between people in a linguistic community. That's Wittgenstein's theory of language. Um, there's a lot more to unpack about the plausibility of this and arguments for it, how it solves certain riddles or issues that we come into in trying to analyze language. It has its own set of problems, like Wittgenstein's own proposal has, has tricky things going on with it. Um, and there's a lot of fun little, you know, like the, this is called philosophical investigations, like a bunch of little remarks that Wittgenstein makes. And he's got a lot of like really insightful um, observations about how language works and just linguistic phenomenon in general. So um, maybe um, we're out of time for today, but maybe we do this. Um, if anyone uh, here live in chat or who's like watching this on YouTube later today, if you want to go through the Wittgenstein reading and have uh, find like little passages or things that he's talking about, you're like, this is interesting to me, or I didn't understand this, but it, I'm interested, I, I'm curious, I'd like to understand it. Maybe I can set aside a little bit of, uh, of time tomorrow um, in class, uh, like at the beginning of our lecture tomorrow, to try to answer some of those things. And I, and I might throw a couple of the really fun little passages or puzzles out there for you um, about uh, Wittgenstein's sort of a angle of looking at language. Um, did, would people be willing to do that? That you could like come to class prepared with things like little passages to discuss that you have questions about? How does that sound? We won't spend all of class tomorrow doing that, but maybe a little bit. Cool. All right, let's do that. Are, are, are people interested in Wittgenstein? Has this been fun and compelling? Awesome. Yeah, I, I, Wittgenstein is, he tickles the brain, you know, definitely tickles the mind. 
Yeah, Red Apple's example is interesting. It might have some more questions about that we could discuss tomorrow too. But I, I think we could give Wittgenstein a little bit more time because I spent a bunch of time at the beginning of the lecture today just talking about the schedule and finishing up the quarter and the papers and everything. So maybe he deserves a little bit more slice of the pie of our time. Um, yeah, okay. So I'll, I'll request that people do that. Um, and we'll go with what you have in mind, and I might throw a couple in there too. So we'll do a little bit more Wittgenstein tomorrow, and then we'll then we'll move on to Williams and and um, and really the I I wanted to, uh, man dang it I forgot about that. So I was I was already requesting that students over the weekend that you think about this YB moral question, and that we have some discussion together in the live lecture about it too. Um, so maybe we can do both of those things, um, if that's okay. Maybe uh, here's a nice consolation. Um, oh, was I saying that for Wednesday? Uh, the reading comments, uh, I think, are due on Wednesday. Yeah, the reading comments for Williams are due. For, so that was the consolation I had in mind. Like, my plan initially on the weekend update schedule was have a discussion about why be moral without necessarily doing the read, Williams reading. And then the William reading is for Wednesday. So the fact that you don't have a reading due for tomorrow, you could use that bandwidth for just considering these two prompts for discussion together tomorrow in class. And I, I really would like to have, um, like you don't need to read the Williams reading, in fact maybe you shouldn't, to entertain this question, this discussion question about why be moral? What are your reasons for participating in morality? Um, but I, I'm hoping that class tomorrow can be less of me just lecturing the whole time and more of us having some conversations. So be, please be prepared for that. If you do have access to a microphone, I think that would be helpful um, because typing things into the chat takes time or you have some stuff already written that I was suggesting in the weekend update email that you just copy and paste, have stuff ready to go that you can just drop in there. Um, but I hope many of you show up to, for tomorrow and have things prepared to contribute and we'll get more out of this. Um, so, okay, just to summarize it all for you, Bernadette, what's the plan for tomorrow? Two things are on my agenda. First, we have some discussion about Wittgenstein, like which parts of the Wittgenstein reading um, are things you're curious about, that you have questions about, or that you'd like to hear me unpack um, and explain a little bit. Uh, there's all these little nuggets hidden in the reading that are really awesome, and we just are doing the tip of the iceberg so far, and, and maybe getting a little bit more of a, a sense of what's happening with Wittgenstein would be cool. So that's the first thing to come to class tomorrow prepared with. If there's passages you want to point our attention at um, that I can explain and discuss. Second thing is I want to have the discussion about why be moral. So what reasons do you have, either rational justifying reasons or just motivational psychological reasons for why you use moral considerations as part of decision making in your life to the extent that you do. So what reason is there for acting morally, for using moral considerations as part of making choices? That I also want you to have some prepared answers for. To like share and as much as possible is like just what you think about this. So um, like truth telling about yourself. Um, do in, The answer could be a negative one. You're like, I don't give a shit about morality. I don't let moral considerations uh, affect my decision making or they don't inform my decisions. But if they do, to the extent that they do, why? And that question can be interpreted in two ways. One of just like, well, here are the things that actually motivate me psychologically to care about morality, but maybe don't justify it. Uh, you, you could be not very proud of those things, for example. You might be like, well, it's just because I don't want to get into trouble, right? But that's not necessarily a reason that justifies why moral considerations matter or are meaningful or ought to inform judgment. But you also could answer that question, why be moral, in terms of, yeah, what reason is there? Why is it justified? to act in a moral way or to use moral considerations as a part of decision making, um, contrary to the choice to live in a moral lifestyle where you make decisions that don't involve moral considerations. Both of those topics are things I'd like us to discuss together tomorrow in class, so that means your contributions and not just me talking into a box. So that's, that's the plan. Does that make sense? Cool. All right. Have a good day, everyone. we got to go. Um, and keep in touch with me about your papers. Good luck with those, and I'll see you tomorrow.